class 11, April 12th. And I'm disappointed. <laughs> disappointed! <laughs> now, um, this was not a super easy one, but it was harder than I thought it was going to be for everybody. Money. That's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> Check your email. I think you're looking at the wrong I'm one. I'm looking at the wrong one. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Um, so, the homework assignment was to um, sort basically an array without the built in sort method using any means at your disposal. Um, yep. So, you could write your own very basic rudimentary algorithm like I did. I, I did that and then I did a few others. Um, that were structured algorithms that are fairly well known. Um, and so we'll look at those briefly today, but we have quite a large class today actually, so we're not going to spend too much time going over the homework. Um, so we are going to put the examples up for you all to pull down and look at, and if you need to check your homework against it, please do. Um, you're still looking at the wrong one. Wow, thanks for this. Is it's just got to refresh. No. You didn't put it on your phone. I just realized that. During the crash. Yeah. Um, the one that I will go briefly over, I'm not going to go over like the quick sort or the insertion sort or selection sort. I want to go over kind of a common sense approach to the sort, um, which I was talking to. Uh, couple of people a little bit about before class started and that's um, this is just a method methodology I made up okay this is not a very efficient sort but efficiency wasn't the point of this assignment um, but it's the way most people probably think about sorting a list when they have to go actually sort a list of something so if you look at my main file here I make a random array I um, put together my sortable list class. I personally allowed my array of numbers to be passed in through the constructor. Didn't have to do that, that was not a requirement. Um, and the first thing I do is I print out the unsorted list of numbers. Then I just put out an empty line so that you can see the separation between the two. And I print out the sorted list. So in the sortable list file, in the sortable list file, yeah, that one. I'm keeping up. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, you can see that I've taken my default here, okay, inside my constructor, and I set it equal to a variable called original. That's my original list. So already I've not tapped the requirements out because I can request the unsorted list and get that guy back, right? As long as I don't touch original, I don't change it in any way. Um, the brunt of the assignment was around this method, sorted. So this was my personal approach to solving the problem. So I essentially said, okay, well so that I don't damage my original list, I'm going to make a copy of it. So I utilized a method called DUP, dupe for duplicate, on an array. Like I said, this is an optional thing. And uh, I set it equal to a local variable list. And then I made a second array that was empty called sort. All right? Now, what am I trying to do when I have an unordered array and I want to turn it into a sorted one in, a, in, in ascending order? I'm saying that I want to go through the list and I need to find the lowest number in the list and I want to put it in the first relative open position I have inside of my sorted array okay and I want to do that for every position in that empty array so how many numbers do I have well I've got however many I passed in and I can ask for that with length so I say list.length Okay, well, I want to do something for each of those. I could have used an each method. I could have used a times method. 
which what, whatever loop structure for you aside from probably math, math is doing some other stuff for you. But times do, okay? I really don't need this index right here, but I put it there anyway. So what am I trying to do for every one of these positions? I want to find the lowest number. We just said that, right? So I say, okay, well, I'm going to grab the lowest number here. And all I did was I said, hmm, now I know some magic has to happen here, some complex algorithm, maybe some additional looping. I'm not sure what that needs to do yet, but I know what my goal is. My goal is to find the lowest number in the list for this iteration, right? So I just wrote that down. I didn't have a method for it yet. I just put it there. And I passed in list because that's the list I want to find the lowest number in. <coughs> Okay. Well, I assume, I go ahead and I assume that I got the lowest number back, and I used list.delete, okay? We've used that before with our books, I think, in our library example, didn't we? You pass in the, re the uh, a copy of the object that you want to remove from the array, and it removes it from the array. So, I'm saying, okay, well, if the number is three, and that's my lowest number in the array, it's saying, okay, well, delete number three. Not index three, the number three, okay? And so it removes it from the list and simultaneously pushes it onto my sorted array, okay? Because it's a parameter and it's push now, right? So if I try to run just that section, just this class right here, it wouldn't run because I haven't defined this magical implementation method yet, right? So what do I need to do for lowest in list? Okay, well, now I've actually got to answer that question. How do I find the lowest number in an array of numbers? You said it earlier. What, what do I have to do to find, to find the lowest number in an array? Look at all of the numbers. Okay, I have to look at all of the numbers. Automatically, that ought to tell you loop. I've got to look at each of them. Okay? That ought to be a giveaway, <laughs> all right? So I know I need to look through each of them. What do I need to do? Well, I need to see if that number is lowest or not. Well, how do I know what my current lowest is? All right, I need something to compare by. So I made one local variable outside of that loop <coughs> called lowest, and I went ahead and primed it. I set it equal to the first number inside the list. Because so far, that's the lowest one, right? And then I said, for each of those numbers, if the number that I'm currently looping over is lower than the lowest number that I've had previously, replace the lowest with that number. So it's going to iterate through all of the numbers in the array. And even if it's the last element in the array that ends up being less than the first, oops, excuse me, it's going to replace this value, and then I'm going to return it. So I'm not just comparing two numbers there. I'm comparing all of the numbers there and just trying to find the lowest one. So if I have 3, 2, 1, 4, okay, my first number is 3. The next round is 2. Well, 2 is less than 3, so I set lowest equal to 2. Next time around, it's 1. Well, 1 is less than 2, so I set lowest equal to 1. Well, then it's 4. Well, that's not, so it stays 1. Right? Everybody follow along on that? Okay. So, I just solved a fairly complex problem that's a couple of levels of looping deep, but I only had to solve it one level at a time. It goes back to the same thing we talked about with the accounts problem. Don't look at the whole picture and try to solve the whole problem at once. That's too much. That's too much work. If you break this up into pieces, this is a very rudimentary problem. You just have to think of it in terms that you understand. Now, once again, I do want to reiterate that this is not an efficient sort. Don't use this on big lists. Okay, it's not, it's not the least efficient sort. The least efficient sort is probably, a, I guess it's bubble sort. 
don't ever use bubble sort for anything. <laughs> I know some of y'all looked at that, but yeah, don't use bubble sort ever. It, it's the, oh God, it's bad. But um, it's a fun algorithm and it's cool to say. It's <laughs> cool to say. It's cool to say, but no, don't use it. Um, do you want to go to the uh, selection sort example? Okay, this is one using an algorithm called selection sort. I'm sure some of y'all saw it before. I'm not going to talk about the algorithm, but um, the basic premise that both this one and insertion uh, relies on is that I don't remove items from any array, any either of them. Okay. I'm never taking an item out of an array like I did in my example. That was an easy way of taking care of a problem. What that problem is, is that I have to be able to swap two numbers inside of an array to sort it. If I find out that index 3 is less than index 1, well, I need to swap them, don't I? And then I need to start over there and see if the new index 1 is less than index 2 again and keep going until the list is sorted. And so the selection sort, and if you want to go ahead and pull up the insertion sort, these are two different ways of handling that algorithm. And they uh, iterate over the uh, array very differently, but they both fall back on this basic swap principle. Okay. Um, anyway, that was your homework. So, um, like I said, I made up a small little rudimentary algorithm. Didn't care about efficiency. Do go back and try to do that yourself. You know, it's a good exercise. Um, I would recommend trying to stay away from looking up these algorithms and just implementing them until you get <coughs> much further into your programming career, maybe a year or two. Because I know this doesn't make sense to anybody looking right at it. And the quick sort example that I showed y'all last week, I know didn't make any sense looking right at it. Um, so practice what practice what's kind of on your level. You know, do it, doing the research on these is good, but they're not going to help you with your programming. So anyway, that was your homework. Um, what's the next thing we need to talk about? I'm going to go on over, uh, I guess we can go ahead and start database stuff, huh? Mm -hmm. All right. This is going to be fun. I mean, I haven't uh, watched it. You have a very um, least efficient time. I do. It's so that I'm rarely depressed. <laughs> That's great. I, I haven't watched the previous lesson yet because it went up a little bit later than usual. Yeah. Uh, was there anything that um, I missed last time? Um, that's covered me to this class. No, no, not not today. What about like no. your stuff? Do I? Did we just do like large like data based stuff? Uh, we we did some slight review, um, and talked a little bit about some asset management and rails, and we had a guest speaker. Okay. And so, um, you can go back and watch the lecture video for that, but as far as what we're covering today, it's all new material. So, okay. so yeah, you're, 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 you're fine. Um, all right, so who wants to tell me what a database is? Does it have something to do with the server? A place that holds data. A place that holds data, that's pretty good. Okay. It's a loose definition, but that's kind of what I was looking for. All right, so give me an example of a place that holds data. Library. It is. That's a database. Okay. Uh, what about on a computer this time? A hard drive. <laughs> hard drive is a form of a database. Sure. A floppy disk. Okay. Yeah. Those are removable media. Application like uh, Access. Access is a database platform. It is. Yeah. Um, what about file a folder? Explorer. <laughs> well, the file explorer is a browser, but but yeah, the the folder structure would be considered a database. A folder with a bunch of files in it. Um, now, the types of databases that we're talking about are fairly specific. 
Um, there's tons of different types of databases out there. There are some that do manage over files and folders. There are some that manage over single files. There are some that manage over uh, split partition files and do really weird things. And there, oh God, there are some that live in the memory. And I mean, it, it, the list just goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, most of the time during this class, I think, I don't think we're going to venture off of the standard here. The, probably the most widely used form of database today with regard to software development is called a relational database. Okay? Now, the way this looks, okay, that like literally looks when you're looking at the data, um, think of it as kind of an Excel spreadsheet for now. Okay? So you have a bunch of columns. Each of those columns represent a different attribute of data, okay? Different property or something. And each of those rows is a completely new item, all right? So uh, I might have, um, let's say I have a database, okay? For an application that's um, an address book, okay? Very simple example. So I'm keeping track of my contacts in that address book, all right? In relational databases, we store data in tables, okay? Tables is what you can think of as the Excel spreadsheet, okay? It's literally like a table of data like you've seen on old HTML websites and stuff like that. Um, so this particular application, probably we really only need one table to start with and that table would hold our <coughs> contact information. So I would probably call that table contacts. No reason not to, right? So what, what, what kind of information would I want to keep about a contact? Phone number, phone number address, name, 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 address, name, billing name. information. Okay. Well, if it's an address book, I probably don't have billing information for them, but <laughs> can but I yeah. tell social? <laughs> but um, but yeah, an address. Um, and, and I'm glad you said address because it kind of leads into what the, the next part I'm going to talk about. But rem remind me of address here in a second. We'll go back to it. But um, in a standard relational database, where does where do you think the relational comes from? It relates to another piece of data in that. Database? Oh, that's kind of close. I'm happy about that. <laughs> that would make me feel good. Uh, okay, so we already have a contacts table, right? And we discussed some different columns that we might have inside this, this thing. So we might have name, we might have email, we might have phone number. Well, in most modern database, relational database systems, we have something else called a uh, primary key column. All right? That is an, essentially an index. It's an identifier. It's a unique identifier. Okay? And in most standard systems, you'll see it called ID. All right? Now, this ID, and this works slightly differently depending on what kind of relational database system you're using, the general concept is the same. The ones we're using will auto-increment for you. So let's say you said, okay, well I have a new contact, so I put the information here, I commit the row, I commit the record, each row is a record, okay? It gets an ID. The next one goes in. It gets auto incremented to two, so on and so forth. All right? Now, that's useful because this you can always trust to be 100% unique. Like the hash. Okay. Same concept of uniqueness, different structure, but yeah, it's 100% unique. Um, now, if I'm here looking through my contacts, all right, I might have people with the same name. 
Okay. I might have two Johns. I might have two Jeremiah's. Mm. Might <clears throat> have two Davids. Okay. But I'll always be able to distinguish between the two because of the ID. Okay. Now, that ID is not just used to keep things unique. <coughs> we talked about address, right? Now, let's imagine for a second you've got a family living at a particular address, okay? And you've got the contact information for both the husband and the wife, okay? And that's your record number one and record number two, okay? Well, if I have a column here for address, or what's more common is that there's separate columns for street, state, zip, city, you know, that kind of stuff. If I have all those columns out here and they're at the same address, I just duplicated the same data over and over and over for everybody at that residence. Now their contact information is different. Their primary key, their identifier here, the fact that that's called a primary key is very important. Um, but the address got duplicated. We call this not being normalized. Don't worry about what that means so much. Just uh, think of it kind of like reducing duplication. Okay? So instead, what we would do is we'd make an addresses table. Now, your addresses table would follow the same kind of pattern. It'd have an ID, it'd have a city, a street. Yada, 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 okay? But, I can keep those uniquely, but how do I relate the two? Okay, if I have one address record here, and that's where these people are living, how do I relate this information to this? Kind of like there's two different files, so you have to correct pull on the other file? Mm -hmm. Some point of the line. Has it to do with the primary key? It does. That's the only thing you can trust to be unique, right? I can't just say, okay, well, let's put the city there because then that doesn't really help you any, right? It's not another primary key on the address? But that's what you're saying? It's not a primary key when it's here. It's a primary key when it's here. Okay. Both those tables have primary key columns. That's what I was okay. Yeah. So both of these people do have an address though. So what I would do is I would put the primary key that's in this guy here in this column. We call that a foreign key. Foreign? Foreign key. Yes. Okay. That is a foreign key relationship. And that's kind of at the foundation of why we call them a relational database. They relate. We can bind rows, records, and certain columns to other records and other tables. So um, now this particular relationship is very simplistic. They can get very, very complicated. All right. Um, I'd say there's way more patterns that you can do with table organization that we're going to talk about, like table inheritance and whatnot. We're, going, we're not going into any of that, but um, this we would call either a one-to-one -one relationship or a one-to-many relationship, okay? Who wants to guess how that relationship goes? Hand in hand. Kind of just said it. One-to-one. One -to -one. One -to -many. How does, how does that work? What do you think that means? A one, a one to many relationship? You can have many foreign keys. Let's say like one, there's like one central network, there's like one central, I guess, kind of bank of information that links that to different other ones. A tree. Well, think, think, of it, think of it more between relating single records, okay? When I'm talking about an address and a contact, okay? or how these concepts of an address and a contact relate to one another. 
in our specific example, okay, and conceptually you can make it go the other way, but a person in our example is at one residence, and a residence can have many people. Okay, that's the one to many mapping. All right. Um, you see that drawn many, many different types of ways. Sometimes you see like this little crow's foot example. Um, sometimes you'll see just a line with a one to a, uh, like a zero dot 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 saying, okay, well, zero or more. Because just because you have an address here doesn't mean you necessarily have a person in it, right? Right. So it's zero or more, right? You still have the unique ID though, right? You still have the ID. I still have my primary key here. And the one another. If you had the zero. Well, no. Oh. If, if there's no, if there is a zero here, that means that I don't have somebody staying at that address. Okay, I, I could have one. I could have two. But zero is perfectly okay. All right. Um, we could also argue that this relationship could go the other way, huh? People could have a couple of different residences. They probably have a primary residence, but they could have more than one residence. Um, could argue that both are true, right? An address can have many people, and people can have many addresses, right? That one's a little different. That one is, you could probably guess, a many to many relationship. All right, now it can look in very, uh, several different ways. Sometimes you'll see it written like that, okay, the crow's foot on both ends. Sometimes you'll see zero or more on both ends. Sometimes you'll see one or more on both ends. It just kind of depends. Um, how would that work though? Kind of complicated, and there's a problem with it. There's no pulling the number for contact strings. I'll have to get your information with the address. Well, it, it, they can. We we can keep putting records in them all day, and they can relate to one another. But the problem is, how can I tell what address is tied to what person? Can I ever specify? Kind of weird, isn't it? Add another column. Say primary. Oh, you were. I thought he was about to say it. God. <laughs> oh, I got so excited. <laughs> we would add another table. Oh. <laughs> well, that's what I meant. Primary, secondary, yeah. tertiary. Yeah, you're not getting out of this. <laughs> yeah. How many tables are going to have about this? Oh, it's. Oh shoot! I don't even know how many we have in our application. We have a relatively small data footprint in ours, and we have probably close to 40. Okay, I don't know that many. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not uncommon for a large application of hundreds. Just to, my capstone project in college had, I think, 120 something. Done, done. It's, oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> it, it's, uh, I mean, it, it's, it just depends on what kind of data you, uh, you have to retrieve. And all those guys have to relate to one another somehow. Now, a table doesn't have to have a relationship to every other table. So you can cut off small chunks of it and look at it. You don't have to look at the big picture the whole time. That's kind of what we're trying to get away from, right? Looking at the whole picture all of the time. So how would, uh, if, we, if we know we have to add another table to make this work, um, you know you can leave these over there. Yeah, I, I, I just thought about that. Most of the guys yeah. hold them. That's, pr that's pretty smart. I wish I thought of that. Um, so let's assume, so let, let, let's assume that we have that issue, okay? All right. Now, I could add a foreign key to both of them, couldn't I? It won't work, but I could. Right, so we've already said we need another table and the problem, what does that table need to have? What does it need to do? Have the 
have a primary address. A spot for that, call them for that. <laughs> Come on, man. So I need to connect the two tables. Needs to oh, connect the two yeah. tables. Okay. And what, what, what would I call this? There's a kind of a standardized way of doing this. Um, if you can come up with a better word for that join table, that's what we call this, a join table. I recommend it. Um, I'll show you an example one later. But the standard is you take the two words and you basically put them together, but singularly. So it'd be a contact address. So, if I have a contact address here, what columns do I need? I'm not saying it anymore. I'm waiting on you. <laughs> okay, that's not necessarily a wrong notion. That's all right. It's, it's not required here. For this one, but, uh, Three. No, that, that's an address. Primary. First home, second home, first address, second address. No, you were right, stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the answer is already up here on the board. Name? No, that's part of the contact. What's the then, problem we're trying to solve here? Then you probably need a foreign key. I need some foreign keys, don't I? Yeah. I need to be able to tell what contact and what address this is talking about, right? So, I need a contact ID and I need an address ID. Now I can isolate a single record. I couldn't do that before. Okay? Now, I don't need this, this ID. I don't need this guy here in this table. If I didn't include that guy, I could tell that a record was completely unique if I made sure that these foreign keys were completely unique. All right, that, that's called compound primary key. We won't be going into that too much. We won't be doing any of that in this class. Um, there's so much about databases we're not going to cover here. It's not even funny. Just even relational databases. People get jobs just to do this all day. What? And uh, I mean, they okay, uh, it's a it's something that's Holy like yeah. mile miles deep type situation. You know, we're barely touching the surface. Um, so most of the time, what we're going to be doing is we will be including this ID column in any join relationships that we have. Okay, and that's how we will handle uniqueness of contact address. Okay? Now, David, I'm going to ask you to chime in here. Because there is something else we can put here that would be useful to the system. <laughs> Order? Okay, that's not a bad one. Not the one I was going for. But <laughs> you already said it. What was the reason why I was picking on you? Primary? Primary. <laughs> because now I can tell which one of these is his primary, right? Because I couldn't put it here. Why couldn't I put primary here? Because it's a many to many. It's a many to many, but why can't I put primary there? Because then you wouldn't. It's true or false, right? Primary? We'll say it's Boolean, but why can't I put primary there? You don't know which one it points to. Yeah. Don't know which what it points to. Which table? No, you know which, which table person? it points to. Which person? Remember, an address can belong to two different people. It might be your uh, primary address. It might not be somebody else's primary address. I ain't telling them the house. <laughs> <laughs> So I can't put primary here, but it's perfectly valid for me to put primary here. Because now I know that I'm saying, okay, well this is, this is or isn't the primary address at this address for this person. Okay? I know it's moving quick. It gets pretty deep, doesn't it? You bring it back memory. I used to design <laughs> databases in the 90s and I was like, <laughs> Yeah, and, and so this totally is, different now. <laughs> this is 
very shallow material. If y'all want to know more about databases, if you think it's interesting at all, I'll, knowing more about data, databases will never hurt your career. Because, <laughs> like I said, this is about an inch deep view of what a relational database is, and that's only one type of database that's used in a professional industry. There's graph databases, object databases, document databases, and when I say document, I don't mean files. They're different. Um, it's, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, all right, so what's a primary key? What's a primary key? A unique identifier. Okay. Now, let me ask you this, because I'm going to pose a problem to you. Let's say let's say you were developing an application okay, that had a database in the cloud or on some server somewhere. And the application you were writing was a mobile application. Okay? And so your customers would be using this in the field somewhere. You're in their day job. They go away from the office, they do something. They may or may not have internet connectivity where they are, but they need to be able to do their work anyway. Okay? And so at some point, they need to reconcile the data that they have on their machine or their mobile device and push that back to the database. Okay? Now, if you've got couple of people doing the same job at different facilities, we kind of run into a problem, don't we? And that problem isn't making sure we don't miss data. They're able to record it locally. What's the problem? The merging. The merging. Because our primary key auto increments, right? We know it has to be 100% unique. Now, if the last record that was in the table was five before they both went offline, they both did five records on their own and both came back and tried to reconcile that data, both of them now have internally in their local databases on their devices records six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They can't be both be six, seven, eight, nine, ten when they hit the server again. So what do you do? Time stamp. That doesn't fix the issue because even if you go off of that and say, okay, well, who made it first? That's what I meant. You have to change the, someone's IDs, and that breaks their data because then their IDs aren't the same. What if that primary key was used in a foreign key relationship pointing at other data? Mm. Now the data doesn't point to the right record anymore. So what do you do? Wait till you get signal. You call back. You say, are you ready to push or are you <laughs> 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 That's one way to do it. <laughs> um, there's another type of unique identifier that a lot of people use and is becoming more and more popular these days as the place gets more web and mobile oriented. And you've probably heard the term before, but it's a GUID. A G-U-I-D. Okay, or a UUID, some people call it, or have seen it as. It's a globally unique identifier. All right? They are not just numerical. Okay? But uh, he's already looking it up. I was about to say, could you look up the odds of a colliding GUID? Uh, there's a great article out there on it. Yeah, it's 128 bits long, which, if you remember anything from binary, that's. 2 to the 128th Power. is the max uh, number there, which is some ungodly number. Uh, oh, here, yeah. This <laughs> is the number of stars. There's there's more GUIDs than there are stars in the universe. So, yeah, they're not going to collide. You're not going to have two GUIDs, the, typically. That, in fact, uh, if, you ever, if your database ever comes back and tells you, ah, GUID collision, 
either you write a paper about it, <laughs> <laughs> or you double check your code to make sure you're doing something right. Because the odds are so improbable, it's not even funny. But a good looks something like this. Um, Just write another generator, right? <laughs> Like a lot of times you'll see up here inside of uh, squiggly braces, but it's a mix between uh, letters and numbers in a certain sequence. Uh, sometimes they include dashes depending on uh, the standard. I think the, the GUID standard has a fixed size with fixed format, right? But a UUID does not. Yeah. Um, but it goes on and on and on for a little while and then there's a closing one. So the solution to that problem is on the mobile, when you're making these records, you have your primary key, instead of using a number, you use goods. Okay? Because these can reconcile when they get to the server. <coughs> They're still going to be unique. Even if they're not on the same table, what's the likelihood you have a collision? It doesn't matter if you don't even put something in that spot and you go to the next one because it's... Well, uh, I mean, you, you see the math. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> how, I mean, how long do you think it's going to be before that gets replicated? How do you search for the true back up? I mean, search. I mean, yeah. trust that either say in the seventh entry because if you delete a record mm -hmm. these numbers don't shift it's just gone mm -hmm. okay. and and a lot of times in professional software they'll disguise their numbers so that people trying to peek into their architecture don't know how many customers they have if you have a customers table and you've got 50 entries in it they're gonna go oh well, they get next step one. They have 50 customers. We're in good shape. We can we can take them over. So if you delete a record, let's use that as, as an example. It's going to just go one, two, yeah, three, so let's five. say it, it would just go straight from, if I deleted number three and we got rid of this guy, okay? It'd just go one, two, four, five in the database the next time you looked at it. It doesn't fix it. And the next time you put a record in, it's not going to do it as three. It's going to keep incrementing from where it left off. But you don't even have to worry about that going to this guy. Right? Because this is going to be what your primary key is. Now, you asked how you find it. Well, just like you look for it any other way. You say, okay, go find me the contact where the ID is equal to this. Yeah, but it sets a large number. Oh, it won't pop up with any information. That's, we haven't gotten to that part yet. It's not that simple? No. Um, databases have their own language that they talk in. Um, so you can learn another language? No, we're not going to cover it. Uh, because classes are taught over that and we don't have the time. Uh, it's called SQL. Okay. Um, it's probably one of the closest to human readable language. Pull up a couple of examples so they can see basic SQL statements. But what this language is, is it's called a fourth level language. All right? You can literally read it almost like English. Okay? Now, that's not to say that it's easy to write, because you can write some extremely inefficient queries that will wreck your database. Okay? So here's, a, here's an example. The, we're saying select star from customers, which is select all. So when we run this, this is our customers table. When, when we run it, uh, or maybe this is our customers table, this is the result we get. We get all the records and all the, we get all the columns and all the records. Now if we just wanted, maybe we just wanted customer, let's customer, customer name. Case, uh, customer name. We run it again, now we just get customer name. And you can also do things like uh, select customer name from customers where uh, customer ID is equal to something. And you'll get back that specific record. That record, yeah. 
Yeah. Or it can bring back a group of them. You can say where where address ID is this. You want all the people that live at a certain residence. You can say give me uh, all contacts where their address ID is this. Okay. Or you'd have in, in our latest example, you'd say give me all contact addresses oh where the address ID was this some number. You get back those. And then you'd say, now give me all contacts for the contact ID that I have for this. So you, you search so for you one way, and then you can pull out the other, the, the, extract the other data. Sometimes you have to run multiple queries to get the data you want. Okay. Um, or you get really good, and you write efficient single queries, which are more complicated and very doing stuff we're not going to talk about, like joins and intersects and stuff like that to get the tables to tables to kind of fold and join with one another to get the data you're after. But um, we're not doing that. Sounds like some wormholes. Well, but from a, from a web application standpoint, this is how your web front end uh, relates to your, your data in the back end by IDs. So when you see certain things in the URL like record or model name slash 25 for example, that's saying get whatever I'm looking for, whatever resource I'm looking for, get the one with ID 25. So like this right here, this restful resource we've been talking about, get slash movie slash 15. What does that do? We talked about it, remember? It gets you whatever 15 is. It gets what? Whatever the 15th movie is in that movie list. Doesn't give me the 15th one. Oh, the identifier. identifier. It gets me the one with the ID of 15. Because it might not be the 15th one. It might be the 51st thousandth one. But the ID is 15. Okay. Tables can range from, and different databases have different limitations, but on this, I, I don't know if the limitation on Postgres is the one that we'll have on here, but I've seen Postgres database tables that were 40 columns wide and um, six, seven hundred thousand. I'm sorry. Yeah, six, seven hundred thousand records yeah. down, and um, some that were a little smaller this way, like ten columns, but a few million records. Ooh, that seems a little bit smaller. Well, it affects uh, performance quite heavily. But wait, so uh, is it? So it's less performance wise with less tables or more tables? It has like nothing to do with the number of tables, it has to do with the number of columns. Okay, well like so let's say if you have like three super big tables that mm -hmm. have like they each have the same number and then you have like a bunch of little mini ones and a bunch of little mini tables that take up this is roughly the same performance? There are way too many variables for me to answer that because it has to do with the type of query you're running against it, if the query is well formed, uh, what type of data is in it. Um, do you have indexes on the tables? Do the um, keys have covered indexes for your queries? It, it's, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that that we're not going to cover, so I can't really answer the question. But, um, either way, <coughs> relational databases are by no means slow. They're extremely fast. We're talking sub-second. So you request data most of the time if the database even if it has a few million records in a table, it can still return back a result in sub-second. It needs to be made right, but it can. It can also take 30 seconds. And kill your application. And kill your application. <laughs> um, all right. More programming inside of that? Don't ever, ever, <laughs> ever do that. Okay. <laughs> you know why that's bad? No, I'm, I don't. Uh, well, have you, have you ever heard of a SQL injection attack or hack? We talked about that during the break. Okay. Yeah. It's bad. You don't want so, so you don't want people, people executing code it. from your database. It's just like a warning sign. People will try it. We'll talk about during the break. Very well. During the break. Um, okay, so let's keep uh, contacts and addresses here for a second. I want to 
<laughs> right there. <laughs> All right, we're going to be contacting Regressus here for a second. And I want to take a jump over to our kind of next topic. And uh, that is an ORM. Okay. Has anybody ever heard of an ORM? I mentioned one briefly a few weeks ago. I don't think I told you all what it was yet, but. Object relational network. I did. <laughs> and you take good notes. Really good notes. Um, yeah, it's an object relational mapper. And we just got done talking about relational databases. I hope those words kind of connect and mean something to you. So throughout the first five weeks of this course, we've been talking about programming with objects, right? Object oriented programming. So if I have a contact object or an address object in my code that has regular attributes and properties, a lot of the time, not always, but a lot of the time, those are the same attributes that I want to store in my table, right? So what an ORM does is it's this magical system, okay? Most of the time it comes in a gem in Ruby, but they make different packages and other languages for it too, like Kennedy Framework and whatnot in .NET, that can read your database tables, look at what Ruby or whatever language it is, objects you have, and figure out how to map them back and forth. That way, you can say, okay, well, I want contact number, con contact where the ID is one. All right? It goes to the database, it gets this record, but instead of giving you this essentially array of fields with the data and stuff like that, it gives you back an actual contact object that already has methods on it that you can run and operate with. You can call, you can make changes to the data on it using our setters like set name, set email, set phone, and call the save method on the object and it automatically updates the database. It's an extremely powerful system and tool in object-oriented programming. And Rails has one built in. And it's called Active Record. Okay. Active Record is a horrible name for a framework. And it's because Active Record is also the name of a pattern. Okay? Very yeah. original. Huh? It's very original in the programming world. Yeah, it kind of is. Um, the reason Active Record, the, the, the package, the gem, was called Active Record is because it makes an attempt at an implementation of the Active Record pattern. But now when you say Active Record, no one knows which one you're talking about. But Active Record, the pattern, was put down by um, a guy named Martin Fowler. He's written a bunch of articles about it. Um, and essentially what it means is your data kind of comes to life a little bit, right? It's an active record. Each one of these, each record can perform operations, okay? It can have behavioral methods, all right? And that's the type of functionality we're about to start seeing in your Ruby objects inside of Rails. We call those our Rails models. You'll notice that when we start working on an example later, uh, a model that we generate is not just a regular Ruby object with class, yada, yada, yada. It inherits from Active Record. When it does that, it gets bootstrapped with all the magical ORM-ness of the package. And then you can use that same class and those objects to perform actions against the database without having to write any SQL. SQL, sorry, we call it SQL for short. But without having to write any SQL, without having to execute any stored functions on the database, without even having to care about what type of database you're talking to. It could be Postgres, it could be 
uh, MySQL could be .NET's uh, uh, Microsoft servers. Um, but an ORM is essentially a way of making it to where programmers can just keep thinking about the business rules, the programming side of it, not have to worry so much about what's going on with the database, let the plugin, let the package handle the orientation and construction of these queries that they have better things to do than me sitting there doing math. And you don't even have to care that there is a database. You just get to write your code. Okay? So we'll be dealing with Active Record a lot in this class, so it's important for you to understand what an ORM is. Um, so Why don't we go ahead, I know it's a little bit early, but why don't we go ahead and have a break? We can talk about the packet. Well, no, because this uh, next bit we're going to be a while with, and then me and John have maybe a special project to talk to y'all about. That could be pretty fun. Um, what do you mean by special? What do you mean by fun? Just wait <laughs> for it. <laughs> Patience, grasshopper. I brought my uh, laptop with me. Would you be able to install stuff in it? Like maybe after class? Or? Yeah, sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you stop the recording? I did not.